And in November of 1940, the Centerport Station received a message from Hamburg wondering what Siebold thought about setting up an account in a New York bank to which Germany could wire funds to pay this growing spy ring. I mean, an extraordinary coup. And after much debate in the New York office, the, the FBI responded after five days. Since I have, a, have I responded in the, in, the, in the words of Siebold, since I have good connections in diesel lines, I recommend opening a small research office. License, licensed business name and suitable space present no difficulties. As research offices continually need money, you can send me a large amount. The response came, we are in agreement. Open office immediately. Advise when and where you want the remittance sent and the highest amount possible for you to handle without suspicion. Um, thus, the coup de grace of the case. Um, the FBI for, this, for the office, room 627. The FBI chose the gaudy heart of America, the Beaux-Arts building with French Renaissance ornamentation and copper mansard roof at the southeast corner of Broadway and 42nd Street in Times Square. Formerly the Knickerbocker Hotel, it was now an office building known for its most prominent tenant, Newsweek Magazine, whose staffers would remain ignorant of the huge story that was taking place on the sixth floor. Dealing directly with the building's owner, who offered to replace the manager if he wasn't cooperative enough, the Bureau rented room 627 and two adjacent offices 628 and 629. In the days after the deal was reached in late November, agents created a stage set with the largest space occupied by the office of William G. Seabold, diesel engineer, the words painted on the door of 627. The setup was centered around a large desk that was expertly bugged and within a few feet of a silver-coated two-way wall, two wall mirror behind which a bureau agent, usually Richard L. Johnson, was operating a spring-wound motion picture camera in a soundproof space. Quote, we just barely had enough light to make a picture, and it was necessary to slow the camera down as, as slow as it would go and open the lens wide open in order to get a good picture, Johnson said. Positioned within his line of sight were a clock encased within a wooden frame whittled by Agent Friedemann, and a flip page calendar, both of which had numbers large enough to be readily view viewable to future jurors. Well, Siebold had his back turned to me at most times, said Johnson, and at some times he had his face, the side of his face turned to me. Of course, we were more interested in the other person. The conversations in the room were monitored by headphone-wearing German-speaking agents, typically Friedemann and Fellner, who could take the stand as eyewitnesses to bolster Siebold's likely voluminous testimony and recorded onto lacquered aluminum discs by the turntables of the state-of-the-art Presto recording system. 